Tonight, a bold move in the power crisis as authorities take extraordinary steps to head off blackouts in Victorian homes. A big pay rise for two million workers. A grim warning on inflation from Australia's top banker as supermarkets deliver a price promise. COVID changes for air travellers. Details live from the airport. Melbourne's cold snap as the feels-like temperature drops to minus four in parts of the city. And one more big hit for the troubled demons. Live from Melbourne, 7 News with Peter Mitchell starts now. Good evening. Australia's power crisis has taken a dramatic turn with unprecedented action to head off blackouts. The energy market operator has seized control of the electricity market to keep the lights on. Emma, Emma O'Sullivan has the latest on the unfolding situation. And Emma, this is an extreme step. Mitch, it's taken control across five states. It's the first time this has happened to this level. The Australian energy market operator has suspended trading of electricity, saying that the system had become impossible to operate and was breaking down because of rising coal and gas prices, outages and supply issues, all combined with rising demand during this cold snap. The move is designed to ensure that power companies generate enough to meet demand, at least in the short term. A June cold snap means Victorians are using 26% more electricity than we were in March. High demand and soaring prices forcing urgent action. Suspending the entire market is extraordinary. The weather combined with high gas prices and unplanned outages at coal-fired power stations pushed wholesale markets to maximum prices. It was impossible to operate the system under current conditions while ensuring reliable, secure supply of electricity to Australian homes and businesses. Now the market operator will take control of directing supply into the grid. That gives us as consumers a lot more surety that the lights are going to stay on because there is someone who is telling the generators that they have to run. But supplies across the eastern states remain tight. In particular in New South Wales, where we would urge customers in New South Wales to conserve energy this evening. Victorians are being reassured we're not facing the same shortfall yet. We are in the midst of a global energy crisis. What we are seeing across the eastern seaboard is there is undoubtedly pressure on our uh, energy supply, but the advice from AEMO is that Victoria has adequate power supply. Victoria, in fact, is in danger of being left behind and left in the dark. The market operator had placed price caps on electricity earlier this week, prompting some generators to withdraw supply. The regulator issued them a warning. I have written to them yesterday to remind them of their obligations. When they say they can deliver power, they need to deliver power. Victoria is facing other challenges. Yalorn Power Station currently has two of its four units offline. It produces 20% of the state's electricity. Any unexpected events could cause major problems. We will be able to avoid uh, any load shedding events or any blackouts. Of course, that is subject to any unexpected outages in the system. Now, households might be wondering, is this going to affect their power bills? Eventually, it could. The decision to suspend the market is going to be reviewed daily. And now there's some uncertainty about exactly how it will be managed later in winter. Emma O'Sullivan at Docklands, thank you. 2.7 million Australians will receive a pay rise of $40 a week after a landmark decision on the minimum wage. Workers will take home at least $21.38 an hour. The 5.2% jump exceeds inflation and it's the largest increase of its kind in 16 years. The minimum wage gets a maximum increase. Good news for workers like Jack Shortino. I mean, that's terrific. Cost of living is just going up. But one person's wage rise is another person's wages bill rise. I don't really know what I have to do. Barber Ben Zolfagari says his business will take a big haircut. His prices will have to rise or else... If I have to close it, you know, 
that's what I have to do. The Fair Work Commission's decision for the 200,000 workers on the minimum wage, $40 a week, a 5.2% increase to $21.38 an hour. And for the 2.5 million on awards pegged to it, $40 a week for those on up to $869.60. Above that, a 4.6% rise. This level of increase will protect the real value of the wages of the lowest paid workers. For the government, a political victory. Its submission sought a rise above inflation, currently 5.1%. Or as the now Prime Minister put it during Seven's leaders debate, one dollar. And again today. Just one dollar. The result, a dollar five an hour. Those low paid workers, he says, the heroes of the pandemic. These workers deserve more than our thanks. They deserve a pay rise and today they've got it. People will be seeing in their bank accounts what the change of government means. For most, the increase will be paid from July 1, but delayed for hospitality, tourism and aviation workers until October 1. There are uh, sectors of the economy which are still struggling to come out of the pandemic. After a decade of real wage cuts, it's by far the largest increase. The unions had wanted 5.5%. Business, 3 The union movement is really happy with this outcome. This represents a very significant uh, risk uh, to the economy. Business says it will add $7.9 billion a year to its wages bill, fueling higher inflation and tighter profit margins. It could mean that some businesses will have to face the difficult decision to close their doors. A real increase in the minimum wage, but the fear with inflation tipped to skyrocket, the wages claims follow, setting off a dangerous feedback loop prices and pay chasing each other higher and higher. I worry that it is going to be tough under Labor uh, over the course of the next three years. The Reserve Bank has warned a wages price spiral could embed high inflation for years. And then Anthony Albanese will really need all the protection he can get. Mark Riley, Seven News. And Australia's top banker is warning inflation could hit 7% by Christmas. That's the highest level in more than 30 years, putting extra pressure on rising interest rates and the cost of living. Reserve Bank governors only speak publicly when they have something significant to say. We'll do what's necessary to get inflation back to 2 to 3%. A warning shot across the Australian mortgage belt, interest rates will spike. How much? And it's unclear at the moment how far interest rates will need to go up to get that. With petrol, power, groceries all surging, the bank last month predicted inflation would lift from 5.1 to 5.9 per cent by year's end. It's worse. Inflation's too high. By the end of the year, I expect inflation to get to 7 per cent. The rare public comments caused instant reaction. Banks predicting hard, fast rate rises. Goldman Sachs was expecting a quarter per cent hike in August and again in September. September, now it's predicting a half a percent jump each time, while Deutsche Bank goes even further, saying half a percent in July and a heightened risk of three quarters of a percent in August. For mortgage holders, it's a cruel irony. The RBA is effectively increasing the costs of living to try and bring down the costs of living. But Dr Lowe says he's extremely confident that these measures and improving global factors will see inflation fall. When? By the first quarter of next year. With warnings that a 7% inflation rise was an average, many goods would go far higher, especially essentials. So you can't shield yourself from those price increases and therefore the hit to the household budget is immediate and difficult to work around. The supermarket giants today claiming to be doing their bit to help too. Woolworths putting a price freeze on 200 home brand products. Making them immune from inflationary pressure means that customers can have some certainty on things that they're going to buy in their shop each and every week. Coles countering with their own pitch. You've got to work harder than ever to give value. We've got 1,500 products that year on year are still at the same price. Consumers will be looking for savings with the next rate hike expected at the RBA's upcoming July 5 meeting. Chris Reason, 7 News. There's breaking news tonight on the AFL investigation into two Melbourne players involved in a restaurant fight. Tom Brown is at AFL House this evening. Tom, you have exclusive details. Mitch, the Demons tonight are breathing a massive and significant sigh of relief with the AFL Integrity Unit opting not to take any action against Fighting Demons Jake Melcham and Stephen May. The league conducted multiple interviews and even reviewed the security camera footage from the brawl 
at the top restaurant in Paran. The AFL is satisfied that the club imposed sanctions, including undertaking both players to undertake community service, and in May's case a week, are appropriate. Meantime tonight, Mitch, the findings into Bailey Smith's illicit drug use are expected to be announced tomorrow. The precedent is basically two weeks and $25,000, but his management is arguing he should get at least a week discount in light of owning up to the significant uh, issue straight away. Mitch, we'll find out on Smith tomorrow. Tom Brown at AFL House, thank you. A woman is set to plead guilty over a Point Cook fire that killed a young couple and their baby. Emergency crews found the three bodies after being called to the house fire in December 2020. A court was told today a deal's been struck between prosecutors and the defence for Jenny Hayes to plead guilty to arson causing death. She was originally charged with murder. Jenny Hayes will be sentenced later this year. Superannuation accounts have taken another big hit with the Australian share market losing even more ground today. The ASX has now plunged 7% in just five days. After shaving off more than $82 billion yesterday, today some red and green. The ASX 200 finishing down 1.27% at 6,601 points. Christmas colours, but no cause for celebration yet. There's probably more to come. I believe we're halfway through the current bear market. Rising inflation and interest rates are hurting share markets, dampening enthusiasm to invest in companies and buy their products and services. Then investors will start to get confident again. Uh, I'm seeing that happening sometime in the next uh, six to nine months. For the 11 months from July 1 to May 31, the median balance super fund fell 0.3%. But the recent slump puts it on track to finish the financial year on June 30, down 4 to 5%. If we are down by 4 or 5%, that's offset against the previous return of 18%. Super experts recommend checking you're comfortable with how much risk you're taking with your retirement savings. Your super's focused on the long term. If you're not sure, it's probably best to talk to your fund or to your advisor. All eyes are now on the US central bank, the Federal Reserve, which will announce its latest interest rate decision tonight. With inflation in the US running at 8.6% and the unemployment rate at 3.6%, the fear is that the Fed will hike interest rates too far and too fast, triggering a recession there, dealing a big blow to economic growth around the world and crucially here in Australia. Gemma Acton, 7 News. Melbourne real estate has officially become a buyer's market. Vendors had the upper hand last year because of low stock and high demand. But buyers are now in the box seat with more houses on the market and fewer sales. It's taking on average about 29 days for the typical Melbourne property to sell and vendors are discounting the prices by a larger amount as buyers negotiate more. Auction clearance rates have also fallen. There are changes to COVID rules for travellers with moves to scrap compulsory masks at airports. Sarah Jones is at Tullamarine this evening. And Sarah, it's already happening in some states, but Victoria is slow to move. Mitch, federal health authorities have scrapped mask mandates at some airports. It's already been picked up by New South Wales, WA, the ACT and Queensland. But so far, there's no response from Health Minister Martin Foley, who has to sign off on the rule change. The Australian Health Protection Principal Committee changed its advice on masks in airports late yesterday and says there's no need to wear masks inside the terminals from this weekend. Oh, that is fantastic. So good. I mean, you know, obviously keeping coronavirus at bay is a good thing, but the mask is getting irritating by now. I think it's too risky because uh, COVID is not away now, but yeah, I think we better, better. use masks. Mask says, uh, sorry, <laughs> masks are still required on some domestic flights. However, Qantas says rather that it will allow passengers on some international flights to go without them. Mitch. Sarah Jones at Melbourne Airport, thank you. Deputy Prime Minister Richard Miles has met Japan's Defence Minister in Tokyo for formal talks about the growing influence of China in the Pacific. Both leaders have pledged to step up joint activities to deepen Australia and Japan's military engagement in the region. 
The city has shivered through another bitterly cold day. Seven News meteorologist Jane Bunn has the details. And Jane, it felt like minus four at Melbourne Airport. Mitch, for the apparent temperature to fall that far below zero, it's really quite exceptional for Melbourne. We've now shivered through 17 days in a row where it failed to reach 15 degrees. And the latest modelling shows that there are plenty more of them to be expected this winter. Today's wind gusted as high as 83 k's an hour. Planes quickly climbed at the airport as they took off into that headwind. The wind may be blowing from the north, but it's certainly not warm. Tomorrow could be our first winter's day to reach 15 degrees and there's a few more of them to come before our next cold snap. I'll have the full details back in the warm studio with you soon, Mitch. <laughs> You're most welcome. Thank you, Jane. One of football's most iconic figures has finally made it into the AFL Hall of Fame. Nicky Winmar was more than a champion player. He also helped fight racism in the game. The St Kilda star was one of nine greats to be honoured. For Nicky Winmar, recognition long overdue. About time. <laughs> Tony Lockett rarely speaks publicly, but raved about his mercurial mate. He could do everything. I mean, he was just a pleasure to watch and he was a pleasure to play with. I could have kicked the goals myself, you know. <laughs> his response to racist fans changed footy forever. 25, 30 years on, you know, I think we're a lot better game for what he did that day. We will always uh, have the racism side for the rest of our lives, unfortunately, but we're, we're going to still stand there and always say that we are proud of who we are and what we've done. And a unique recovery session today for Boomer Harvey after his induction into the Hall of Fame. The boxing kangaroo preparing for a footy fight night on August 3rd is the AFL Games record holder, but was still overwhelmed. You sit there and you've got to pinch yourself because uh, I certainly didn't think I'd be sitting in that room. Among other inductees, Frio's Matthew Pavlich and Carlton Premiership captain and former AFL chairman Mike Fitzpatrick. South Australian icon Russell Ebert elevated to legend. It's been a long journey, so being a part of this it was uh, it's like the finishing touch. Nick McCallum, 7 News. Still on footy and the Demons season has taken another hit. Tim Watson, they'll be without their captain for weeks. That's right, Mitch. It's a brutal blow for Max Gorn. Mitch Cleary has more. Mitch, he's been struck down by the dreaded syndesmosis. Tim, the Demons fear he'll miss up to five weeks. He has avoided surgery, but Gorn will stay in that moon boot for some time. That stretch of five games, including clashes against ladder leaders Brisbane, Geelong and the Western Bulldogs. It's a massive test for the Demons who are coming off three straight losses. The teams for tomorrow night have just dropped. Dustin Martin ruled out with illness. The Tigers do get back Tom Lynch from his hamstring injury. Ivan Soldo has been dropped. At Carlton, former Kane Sam Durden will play his first game for the Blues to fill a gaping hole in defence. Adam Chera out with that hamstring. Thanks, Mitch. Also ahead, we'll tell you what was on the agenda at a high-powered AFL meeting. An Aussie sprinting superstar takes down a world-class field at Royal Ascot. And a sporting legend is making a grand comeback. Mitch will explain all of that soon in sport. OK, Tim, we'll see you then. Thank you. A finance company has been fined almost $2 million for charging Victorians after they died. The details are next on 7 News. Also, a new challenge for Darren Hinch. Unfolding fire emergency, a house goes up in flames in Melbourne's west. A croc shock for Victorian tourists and later help for parents to keep track of what their children are doing online. Two news just in and a house has gone up in flames in Melbourne's west. Crews are battling the inferno which broke out just after 4.30. The blaze started in the garage and quickly spread to the single storey brick home. The scene in Bonnie Brook is still not yet under control. It's understood no one has been injured. 
A former subsidiary of the Commonwealth Bank has been fined almost $2 million for charging customers after they died. At Vanthouse Investments Limited billed hundreds of com- customers for more than two years after they'd passed away. The Banking Royal Commission uncovered financial institutions charging fees for services they didn't provide. Today, one company was held to account in Victoria's County Court. Avantius Investments Limited was a subsidiary of the Commonwealth Bank, selling superannuation through financial advisors. But the company admits it charged 499 customers advisor fees for 28 months after they had died, in total taking almost $700,000 from dead members. The company knew its product disclosure statements didn't mention the payments, but did nothing about it. In my view, it it was clearly practicable to have taken reasonable steps to remedy the defect once it became known. The company pleaded guilty to 18 charges and was today fined $1.71 million. In all the circumstances, the offending can only be described as a very serious failure of corporate governance and an example of a financial corporation putting its own interests above those of its investors. The company has already refunded the estates of its dead victims. In addition to today's fine, it will also have to pay $1.3 million to ASIC for the cost of the investigation. Jody Lee, 7 News. The federal court has approved an $8.9 billion takeover of troubled casino operator Crown Resorts. The court's decision was the final hurdle in the approval process after Western Australia gave corporate giant Blackstone the green light. The takeover will be finalised on June 24th when the money between Blackstone and Crown changes hands. Darren Hinch has announced plans to shake up state parliament at the November election. The 78-year-old says we're facing a political revolution as voters turn away from the major parties. Just 25 days after failing to win a Senate seat in the federal election, Darren Hinch has a first-time focus, a seat in the Victorian parliament. It just came to me and I thought, why not? Give it a go. In a life filled with so many headlines and controversies, the 78-year-old says he feels just 50. A short time ago, I was sacked. And insists nominating for the upper house is not a desperate bid for attention. I don't think I've ever been described as desperate, except in romance. (laughs) Hinch decided a week ago to run for his Justice Party, then spoke to the party's two sitting MPs to offer a stronger alternative for disenfranchised voters. The biggest issue for Victorians, he says, the cost of living and aged care. People are fed up with the major parties. They want transparency. And he's not inspired by either of their leaders. On Daniel Andrews... He's a touch arrogant. ..and Matthew Guy. I watched him performing at a press conference and I I thought it was quite underwhelming. The government today deflecting judgment. What uh, Darren does is a matter for Darren. Darren Hinch says he's been sacked 16 times, but he has high hopes for success here and five months to convince voters. Otherwise, his famous catch cry will remain true. That's life. (laughs) Paul Dowsley, 7 News. Tourists from Melbourne have snapped to attention when a crocodile tried to climb into their boat in the Kimberley. The group from a cruise ship had hoped to see wildlife on the tour, but not this close. Oh, my God. (laughs) The tourists sailed away, but shaken with a story to tell. You probably don't realise it, but some of our biggest retailers are using facial recognition technology on unsuspecting customers. Why and what it means are next on 7 News. Also, an early morning fire battle in Melbourne's west. Our mumpreneurs are taking control of their lives and creating booming business empires. And take a look at the masterpieces lighting up Acme. Seventy-five firefighters have taken more than an hour to bring a grass fire under control west of Melbourne. The 20-hectare blaze started at Mount Cottrell just before five o'clock this morning. It's not being treated as suspicious. 
It's been revealed some of Australia's biggest retailers are using facial recognition technology on their customers. Stores say it's to protect against violence, but critics aren't buying it. Walking into your local Bunnings or Kmart today, every customer was being watched more closely than ever before. Mate, look at my face if they want, pretty ugly. <laughs> While some see the lighter side of facial recognition technology, others say it's enough to make them stay away. Well, I don't think it's a good idea. That's an uh, invasion of privacy. After a tip-off, Choice started asking questions and the retailers, including the good guys, owned up. We got a tip off from a Choice member um, about Kmart and that made us go and look a bit more deeply. They say it's only to keep the staff and customers safe and identify shoplifters who might come back. It's that major retail chains are routinely collecting facial data of customers should send a chill down the spine of anyone that cares about their personal privacy. While Kmart says it only keeps the data for 30 days, Choice fears retailers could start selling off the information. They're all concerned that there could be future uses for profiling or marketing. Choice is ultimately calling for a wide-ranging investigation by the Information Commissioner. Other groups say this sort of use of technology should just stop until proper legal protections are put in place. So we're calling on the new government to take some meaningful action to ensure that these technologies aren't rolled out without due protections. Though not everyone sees the serious side. It's the new reality, so it's all good. Evan Batten, 7 News. Russia is warning Ukrainian forces hold up in a cut-off city to surrender. It's believed around 500 civilians are trapped alongside soldiers in a chemical factory in Severodonetsk. Like Mariupol before it, much of the city is in ruins. It's in the crucial Donbass region where Putin has refocused his troops. Bridges in and out of the city have been destroyed. It's been revealed Donald Trump's lawyers were still trying to overturn his election loss hours after a violent mob stormed the Capitol. A former White House lawyer received a phone call from a Trump attorney the next day. I said to him, are you out of your effing mind? Right? I said, I, said, I only want to hear two words coming out of your mouth from now on. Orderly transition. The testimony was released by the committee investigating the deadly riots. And Amber Heard is refusing to back down over her bitter defeat in court. She's blaming a social media onslaught for swaying the verdict. And the jury is not immune to that. You think it, the jury saw it? How could they not, to my dying day, will stand by every word of my testimony? The actress says she's paying the price for speaking the truth. A group of Australian mothers think they've figured out the key to balancing work and family life. They're part of a growing trend of mumpreneurs carving out successful business ventures from the comfort of their homes. What started in a garage is now big business. Girls sportswear label Impy recently moving to a new headquarters as orders boom. So the first year was pretty slow, but then by the second year we'd actually doubled sales. And then this year again we've doubled sales again. It started three years ago when Kim's young daughters began running. There was no age-appropriate activewear. She saw it as an opportunity to develop a clothing line while being more available for her kids. You just want flexibility, so if, if you need to be at a sports event or you need to pick your kids up from school because they're sick, you've got that flexibility. It's the same reason podcast producer Brianna Ansoldo launched her own business seven years ago. After a successful singing career, she wanted a job better suited to having a young baby. I wanted to be flexible in my work and I wanted to be able to be there for all the moments that a little kid goes through. There are an estimated 330,000 mumpreneurs in Australia and that number is expected to grow as women strive for a better work-life balance. Always having that end goal in mind, will this be flexible for me? The top five business ideas for working from home include creating your own product like jewellery or clothing, becoming a blogger or freelance writer, selling a digital product like graphic design, becoming a virtual assistant, reviewing products online. The building blocks for a budding empire. Samantha Heathwood, 7 News.
ACME is offering a solution to Melbourne's winter darkness. Light is the subject of a new exhibition featuring 70 works from Britain's Tate Galleries. Turner's masterpiece Deluge is the main attraction. The exhibition starts with painters and, and painterly works and we end with more contemporary works where light becomes the actual material itself. The exhibition runs until November. There's help at last for parents worried about what their children are doing online. Next on 7 News, the new tools to help keep them safe. Also mayhem on the Monash after a multi-car pile-up. And the Victorian pie that's just been named Australia's best. A four-vehicle crash on the Monash Freeway caused chaos during this morning's peak. It shut down three inbound lanes at Yarra Boulevard, banking up traffic for 12 kilometres. No one was seriously injured. Parents who fear Instagram is a bad influence on their children can now have greater control over their accounts. The changes are designed to promote conversations, but critics say... They don't go far enough. 11-year-old Amaya is a rising star on social media, but for now her mum, Nicole, manages her Instagram account. At the moment, because they're still a child, I can manage her page and I can see what she's looking at, but when she turns 16, 17, I have no control over that. New parental controls on the site are giving power back to parents. They can now see who their children follow or are followed by and what their child reports to Instagram. They can also monitor usage and set time limits. It's a step in the right direction. It's certainly not a fix all. There is an enormous amount of inappropriate content that still circulates all around Instagram. A new family hub on the site providing access to mental health support. To help create more constructive conversations between young people and parents about how they're using Instagram. But there's one major catch. The parent and the child must both agree to the new controls before they can be activated. And even then, experts believe they can only go so far. We want them to speak up when things go wrong. That is the most important thing you can get through to a child as a parent. It's when they go quiet and try and hide things that it can get all out of control. Sonia Marinelli, 7 News. Returning to the markets now and the ASX fell again as investors wait for an expected massive interest rate rise in the US tonight. Here's Gemma Acton. Thanks, Peter. No hoped for recovery for Aussie shares today. The ASX 200 dropping another 85 points to close at 6,601. Losses were spread right across the index with Afterpay owner Block once again one of the poorest performers. The Aussie dollar slipped under 69 US cents overnight but has since made a modest recovery while gold has narrowly avoided dropping below 1,800 US dollars for now at least. And Australia's rental crisis worsened last month as the vacancy rate fell again. Now that looks at the number of rental properties actually available. Adelaide has the fewest residential vacancies and Melbourne has the most. Peter. Thank you, Gemma. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are moving out of London's Kensington Palace to relocate their young family to the Windsor estate. It's a cottage not far from the Queen and her castle, with no need for staff or renovations. It's also closer to Kate's parents in rural Berkshire. A mushroom pie made in Ocean Grove has been named Australia's best. The winning pie contains three types of mushroom, cheddar, parmesan, herbs and a truffle filling. Looks good, doesn't it? It's the first time a veg... <laughs> it's... Yeah, OK. Thanks, Nathan. Bit late. It's the first time... <laughs> A vegetarian pie has won the award, delivering back-to-back -back wins for the rolling pin baker 
Nathan Williams. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> Sounds delicious. <laughs> Smells good too. <laughs> yeah. Sports next with Tim Watson. Tim, North Melbourne held a crucial board meeting late this afternoon. They did, Mitch. We'll cross live to tell you what it means for David Noble's future. Also, why the Roos are standing by their number one man. Footy's power brokers break bread as the coaches line up for a big win. And the Aussie horse that stunned the world at Royal Ascot. Welcome back. AFL coaches are toasting a huge win tonight. Returning to Chief Football Reporter Tom Brown and Tom, footy clubs are set for a big boost. Tim, this will significantly allay some of John Longmire or Damien Harbick or Luke Beveridge's concerns regarding the soft cap. Clubs met today and it's basically now been ticked off. The AFL, I can report tonight, will approve a half million dollar increase in the soft cap. It's money that can be spent on coaches, assistant coaches, support staff. Clubs will be able to spend that at their discretion. They won that debate. Now, Luke Beveridge has expressed some reservations and concern about not enough money for things like psychological support and staff. That's been solved under this new model. There's a separate amount of money, up to $670,000 for psychological welfare and medical. In any case, AFL sources tell me if a player needs specialised help, the AFL will exempt the cost of that under the soft cap. Separately, the AFL's illicit drugs policy is now under formal review, including by a separate independent body advising. The Players Association believe in a medical model, not punitive sanctions, and maintain the club doctor should still be the most important person informed at clubs. I spoke to the Players Association boss, Paul Marche, in particular asking him if the policy as it stands is a licence for players to take drugs. The policy is designed to help players that may be taking drugs. It's not necessarily a licence. Now, if you look at the alternative here, which is not to have a policy, then I don't see how this is um, any more of a licence than not having a policy, which is the case in most workplaces. Tim, the association still doesn't want the results of the illicit drug tests published. They're concerned the information may be misused by the clubs. That review ongoing aimed to be completed by the end of the year. Tim? Thanks, Tom. North Melbourne is backing in under siege coach David Noble returning to Mitch Cleary. And Mitch, the Kangaroos are currently holding a board meeting. Tim, that board is meeting right now at the club headquarters before they head to dinner with Noble and the head of footy, Dan McPherson. They insist they're coming in to fix the problems with no calls to be made on the futures of any individuals. The president, Sonia Hood, issuing a staunch defence of her coach and the number one pick. With one win from 13, North Melbourne is standing by its coach, but in a rare public appearance, President Sonia Hood wouldn't be drawn on David Noble's long-term future with his rolling contract unlike others in the AFL. To be absolutely clear, I'm focused on right now and David is our coach right now and he's sorting out our problems right now. Hood hitting out at scrutiny of teenage star Jason Horn francis a two-match suspension coming amid signs of poor body language and mounting speculation. He'll explore a move home to South Australia. I think it's outrageous, to be honest. He's 18 years old. I'm interested in Jason's opinion on Jason. I'm interested in his mum and dad's opinion and his coach's opinion and, frankly, nobody else's. Josh Bruce in for his first game in the VFL after his ACL, joined by Lockie Hunter returning from personal leave. Bailey Smith back at the club Friday. His coach with no doubt he'll walk straight in when his drug ban is sanctioned and served. Bailey values his... Um his football future too much. It's part of his identity, so he, he definitely won't let himself go. Dustin Martin to miss tomorrow's clash with Carlton through illness. Noah Bolter to pinch it in the ruck with Ivan Soldo dropped. The Blues turning to former Kangaroo Sam Durden in defence 15 days after he joined via the mid-season draft. Playing at Glenelg a couple of weeks ago and now he's going to play in front of Richmond, um, against Richmond in front of a massive MCG crowd. Mitch Cleary, 7 News. Aussie sprinter Nature Strip can now lay claim to being the fastest horse in the world. The Chris Waller trained gelding headed to Royal Ascot for the first time and jockey James McDonald fended off a rightless horse to steer him to victory in the King's Stand Stakes. Salute a world-class sprinter, Nature Strip, a ripper in the King's Stand. He's just an absolute freak of a horse. 
And I think it would have silenced a few critics <laughs> with that performance because it was scintillating. Obviously Australia's got a huge racing industry, but until you do it on the main stage, it's another story. So it'll just remind everybody how strong we are in Australia. It's just the seventh Australian horse to win at Royal Ascot, the first since Black Caviar in 2012. To breaking news, and our World Cup heroes have just touched down in Sydney after booking their spot in November's tournament. The Socceroos are now hoping to shock the world, drawn in a pretty tough group, though, against France, Denmark and Tunisia. Cameron Smith has urged the PGA Tour to bring an event to Australia to keep the upper hand over the Rebel Live Tour. It comes as Greg Norman considers adding a tournament here in Melbourne next year. The Saudi back breakaway tour continues to dominate discussion ahead of the US Open. I'm tired of the conversations. I'm tired of all this stuff. Y'all, like I said, y'all are throwing a black cloud on the US Open. I think that sucks. I'm far from the smartest person in the room and I'm not a politician. Um, I'm here to follow a white golf ball around. The US Open begins tomorrow night. David Warner has still got it, even at 36. Oh, that's unbelievable. What a catch that is by David Warner. Ashton Agar couldn't believe his eyes. Pat Cummins went wickerless on his return from a hip injury in the one-day series opener against Sri Lanka. Chasing 282, Glenn Maxwell kept his cool, hammering an unbeaten 80 of 51 balls to get Australia home by two wickets. Serena Williams is returning to the court after receiving a Wimbledon wildcard. The 23-time Grand Slam champion hasn't played since withdrawing from Wimbledon last year with a leg injury. Nick Kyrgios is through to the second round of the lead-up event in Germany, where he'll take on world number six, Stefanos Tsitsipas. And footy's funniest show, The Front Bar, is on tonight at 9 o'clock. The guest, special guest, kicking legend Peter Sumich, is on there tonight. Mitch, and those mushroom pies, they looked okay, didn't they? You don't mind a pie. How many of those do you reckon you could put away on a good day? Just the one would be fine. <laughs> a little bit of sauce on top. I reckon about a three or four for me on a good day. It has made me very hungry, Tim, indeed. <laughs> I can hear your tummy rumble. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jane is next with the forecast. No tummy rumbles. Jane, how's it looking tomorrow? <laughs> oh, Mitch, I keep the umbrella handy as there are showers, a lot more than we saw today. But it's not quite as chilly. The full details are next. Hello. Tonight on the latest from 7 News, the major boost to the minimum wage, what it means for workers and businesses. Plus, Ukraine pleads for more weapons. We're live as world defence ministers decide the next step there. And is this the future of travel? The bizarre double-decker plane seats. Tonight, the latest from 7 News, right after the front bar. Hello again. The air's cold in Melbourne. The wind really has an impact. At the airport, it felt like minus four this morning. The city has now endured its 17th day in a row below 15 degrees. It may have looked a bit like this in a sunny break this afternoon, but showers are passing through and the wind has some bite. It is blowing from the north, but it certainly isn't what you'd normally expect with that direction. The cold air extended right up into Queensland and the Northern Territory, so wind from there isn't warm anymore. However, Geelong and Avalon did reach 15 today. That's a sign of things to come. Showers are crossing Victoria. There's local storms in the northwest. There are big differences in the temperature. The central north and northeast is stuck under low cloud with rain. A few spots didn't even reach double figures. Bendigo, 9.9. But the northwest has thawed out. Mildura reached a top of 19 today. It's their highest temperature in two and a half weeks. Our winds turn northerly ahead of a low pressure system that is set to slowly cross Tasmania and dissipate. High pressure takes over after one more minor surge coming up from the south on Friday. So as that low crosses Tasmania, we have showers in Victoria. They'll clear from the northwest of the state while they increase over central parts in the southeast tomorrow. Only the southeast feels the last bit of this long stretch of weather systems on Friday into Saturday. There are showers in Gippsland and Melbourne's southeast with some wintry hail. But as the high comes in, and this time it's likely to settle in for a few days in a row, we'll have lots of sunshine. The winds become quite light and it isn't as chilly as it has been.
Around the nation tomorrow, Brisbane 24, Sydney 20, Hobart dry, but Cameron, Adelaide showery, Perth at 22. To Victoria, showers across the south and east, widespread in central parts, over Gippsland and on the ranges, but snow only falls on the highest peaks. Dry in the northwest, areas of lingering cloud. It is cool to cold, the wind and air isn't quite as chilly as parts had today. Closer in, showers across town, most frequent over eastern suburbs, the wind turns southwesterly. Today was gusty, tomorrow a moderate wind, so it won't feel as cold and temperatures rise across town. We've had our overnight low of 11 degrees at 6pm, now 12. Temperatures should actually rise through the night, 13 by dawn, 15 by lunch. But not pleasant, we've got lots of showers passing through. In the eight day outlook, here's our run of not as chilly weather, then the next cold snap arrives here in the next week. Friday, it begins drizzly but a little bit of sun in the afternoon most are dry sunshine by saturday afternoon fog then sun for sunday so saturday and sunday is nice and then the next wet weather begins later on tuesday so we should rise to 15 tomorrow that'll be the first time in two and a half weeks but 15 yes it's not quite that pleasant we've got lots of showers passing through. we'll take that with open arms <laughs> we will thank you very much indeed jane now here's what's on sunrise tomorrow Thanks, Mitch. Tomorrow on Sunrise, beating the meat price hikes. Our exclusive consumer investigation reveals how to find the best quality and price. See you in the morning, Melbourne. And that's the way it is this Wednesday, the 15th of June. Thanks for your company. For now, from the Seven News team, good night. <laughs>